Welcome to Max and Stacy Report. I'm Max Kaiser coming to you from El Salvador, land of the free, home of the Bitcoin. Yeah, we've been talking about what's happening in the global economy now for many, many years. And we've been right almost every single moment of every single day for every single year we've been on the air. And that's a fact, Jack, Stacy. Hey, Max, you know, in the second half, you interview Paolo Arduino of Bitfinex and Tether. And since that interview, there's a big story out and that's key t- Key, K-E-E-T dot I-O. This is a new app that they're running, an uh, open source platform running. It's like all Bitcoin, Web3, without the blockchain, without the token, without the scammery. Uh, they call it, it's a peer-to-peer chat app built with Hole Punch, which is a platform that allows anyone to create apps that don't use any servers. No blockchain, no tokens, just your peers. Right. Bitcoin scaling. You know, they're scaling Bitcoin with stuff that is uh, replicating other technologies, but done on the Bitcoin protocol. And this is what scaling looks like. And it's all very exciting. And of course, this means that all the altcoins out there will be disintermediated out of existence, uh, as we've been saying, and as we know that they would. Remember, every single altcoin, once it hits their initial high against Bitcoin, always trades down towards zero. Right. And we're heading towards the next layer of scams. Remember, because we've talked about first we had the altcoins back in like 2013, 14, 15. Then we had the ICO scams, which was, um, you know, in the altcoin, the original altcoins, they were just trying to. There were some people that, you know, we thought like maybe uh, there would be like other coins because, you know, all the Bitcoin core devs like Mike Hearn and Gavin Andreessen were rage quitting. And then we had the 2016 through 18 scam of the some of the OG Bitcoiners running off with huge amounts of money on these so-called uh, tokens, the initial coin offerings. And then in the and the, this, the recent collapse is DeFi, that's uh, Silicon Valley and Wall Street kind of getting in on, the, on scamming at a much bigger level than even happened in 2017 with the ICOs. Next level will be the CBDCs, the central bank di- digital currencies. Um, but that will be with genuine no recourse sort of scammery. Uh, it's just a continuation of the you know, that whole sector of shit coins, like that whole scammery. But leading up to that, I want to show you how that's going to happen. Because what we have right now is the inflation and the inflation raging around the world. Food prices are up like 12% in the U.S. in the last year. And this is a sign of the collapse of the previous scams. The previous scam being the one that operated from 1971 until, well, basically 2020, March of 2020, when we started the pandemic printing, the money printing. And so now we're seeing the results of all that that decay and the collapse of that system. Uh, Here is a food price chart from McKinsey. And what it shows is food prices have reached record highs. And this uh, goes back, you could see during the, you know, the last financial crisis when we were reporting uh, first reporting this sort of content, you know, you see that when that triggered unrest around the world, riots and revolution, uh, it's worse than that right now. Right. I like the way you describe, you know, the history there from altcoins to ICOs to DeFi's. And now we have the centralized bank digital currencies, the CBDCs, which would kind of represent the fiat money scam coin singularity, uh, which is operating in parallel to the Bitcoin singularity. Bitcoin singularity would be when Bitcoin becomes hyper-Bitcoinization, like we see in El Zante, in El Salvador. It's essentially the economy is a Bitcoin economy, a circular economy. In the fiat money world, they're heading into the fiat money singularity, which is where you have a central bank digital currency. And it's a singular sensation, a circular economy of a spiraling down into the ultimate collapse of centralization, central banks, central uh, eyes governments. And uh, this is all happening at the same time. I think this is why people uh, don't understand that you can't be in both camps at the same time. You have to be in either part of the fiat money apocalypse or part of the Bitcoin revelation. Those are the two that you have that choice to make. Right. And the the thing about I'm going to skip ahead to the CBDC headline, because the thing about the CBDC, the central bank digital currency, 
is it kind of reminds me of a poop shelf, right? So in Northern Europe, Germany, the Holland, Netherlands, all that sort of place, you like they, they have a poop shelf. So I'm going to read to you what a poop shelf is and then how compare that to the CBDC. So a poop shelf, according to somebody online, <laughs> is that the purpose of the shelf is inspection. You're meant to look at the consistency, shape, color, abnormalities, etc., before flushing, and then hope that the rush of water cleans the shelf enough, otherwise that's what the brush is for. So in this case of the CBDC, the poop looks back at you, and that is the CBDC. So it's examining you, <laughs> your use of the money, your use of currency, of their currency. So they're planning on, as they lay out here in this headline about a CBDC. <laughs> don't, don't look so disturbed. Well, this is like a scene out of Beetlejuice or maybe Ghostbusters. You're talking about poop staring back at you <laughs> from a poop shelf. Um, I mean, this is the kind of thing that dystopian nightmares are made of. I am shocked. Well, <laughs> let's look at why I say this. According to this headline from Coindesk, Speaking of shit coins, could a digital dollar be a cure for some of the United States' financial instability? Some U.S. federal researchers think so. A paper examining CBDCs found that they could warn regula re regulators, I guess, of impending distress, allowing them to act more quickly. So the purpose of the poop shelf is you're supposed to look through it and see if there's any sign that you might be ill. The same thing here is they're like saying like they'll be able to examine you like your your consumption like as it goes in at the other end the money goes in and it comes out the other end on uh, in their surveillance system it's a surveillance coin well speaking of movie references this reminds me of the Cheech and Chong movies where uh what I think Cheech or maybe it was Chong says hey this is really good shit and uh the other guy says uh, really what is it and he says it's it's actual shit so this is a CBDC, um, a central bank digital currency. They're smoking their own feces, in other words. That's what the point of it is. And they're, and they're saying that this is what's getting them closer to understanding how the economy works and to be able to ferret out if there's, in fact, a crisis on the horizon. The CBDC is the crisis. Exactly, exactly. Well, the CBDC is the poop on the poop shelf looking back at you. And, we, I mean... All they need to do, they don't need to concoct a surveillance coin and a shit coin. What they need to do is just instead watch Max and Stacey report. Because we look at these charts and the headlines and juxtapose them and tell you what is actually happening. And that is, why is Europe in such awful shape? Consider the plight of Germany. In May, Germans paid 35% more for 9% less imports. These are not typos. When you pay a third more to get almost 10% less, you are going to find yourself in deep, deep trouble. So this chart, you know, we're looking at the, the poop that is the economy, the crappy economy, and we're, we're able to see that it looks sick because if you're paying 30% more for 10% less, well, that's going to cause unrest. That's a sign of ill health of the entire economy, the monetary system, and usually that causes bad things based on past experience throughout the last four or 5,000 years of these sort of conditions. Right, well, in Germany, of course, the situation is going absolutely inflationarily out of control. And in that case, this is a very popular for the poop shelf in Germany, uh, if you go to Germany, you'll see this in the toilets quite often. So to put it this in terms of perhaps what Germans could understand now that they're in the crisis, and that would be a fecal transplant. So if you take Bitcoin and you think of it as a fecal transplant and you insert it into the German economy, it would drive out the parasites that are the euro. That is Christine Lagarde. Remember, Christine Lagarde is a parasite. Uh, much more parasitical even than Jamie Dimon. And Jamie Dimon is the tapeworm's tapeworm. He got voted tapeworm of the year last year. You know, speaking of Germany, they're in this next headline as well. Uh, again, if you just look at the chart, if you look at the data, and, uh, and if you look at and examine it, and you're looking at it on the shelf, that is, you know, the chart data, 
what you see is a sign of ill health and um, that basically you should intervene and stop this crisis f from happening. And you could do that if you had any sense to your economic and monetary and geopolitical policy, because the headline says the bill for rescuing the European energy market this winter will easily top $200 billion dollars warrants Javier Less in the Bloomberg. So $200 billion because they can't resolve a situation, a geopolitical situation. And again, that's going to cause more inflation on the other side, more supply chain disruption, uh, not only from the money printing needed to rescue these, uh, the gas companies, uh, the energy companies in uh, Germany and then elsewhere in Europe, but of course, there are all sorts of products that are and supply chains that will be disrupted because of the shortage. Like money can't print that over. They're just looking at the bill for the actual rescuing just of the energy companies uh, because they're not allowed to charge, you know, more than the rate that the government sets. So it's higher than that that they have to pay. So the government's going to bail them out. And therefore, um, it, it still means there's a shortage of energy. There's still a shortage. So you, the, the industry built around it will fall apart. Right. Well, you're talking about this winter and the growing problems. I mean, looking ahead to Christmas, I would expect that people will replace their elf on a shelf with maybe Mr. Hanky on a shelf. That'll be the, uh, the, the Christmas present uh, most popular this year uh, as we see this transition from any semblance to a sound economy to one that's driven entirely by central bank fecal matter. Well, in fact, you know, it used to be considered back in the old days, you know, it used to be considered an insult to give somebody a lump of coal for Christmas. Actually, this year, that's <laughs> going to be a prized possession. Right. People are going to be like, thank you, Santa. This is like the most amazing gift ever. Yeah, the North Pole is flooded with letters to Santa. Please send coal. Well, from Germans, please, Santa, we need more coal. Well, that's all very fascinating. It is. Can't wait for Christmas. All righty. Well, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, much more coming your way. Thank you very much, uh, Max, for having me. Yeah, so stable coins are a type of cryptocurrency that is pegged by, to um, national currency. In the case of Tether, USDT is pegged to the dollar. So the reason of um, the reason to exist of stable coins, especially when Tether was born in 2014, was actually making uh, trading arbitrage faster, more efficient. Right, arbitrage uh, and uh, low spreads across multiple trading venues are a symptom of a maturing uh, trading financial in industry. So, in 2014, I'm sure you recall, Max, uh, the um, the arbitrage was almost impossible. To send a wire between two trading platforms was taking ages. Right, one day if you were really lucky, but um, uh, minimum five days was uh, the average. And um, the arbitrageurs are type of traders that need to sell high, uh, sell Bitcoin on the, on the exchange where the price is higher and buy it back on the exchange where the price is lower and move cash between these two exchanges really fast. And that was not possible. It's still not possible today. Bitcoin moves at a pace that is 10 uh, minutes per block on average. And while fiat is extremely slow and is kept together by rubber and bands as um, you know technological infrastructure. So 
uh, we wanted, we had just, uh, Tether had just this simple idea. Let's put uh, the, a dollar on a blockchain, right? And really simple as that. Today, we are seeing stable coins being used more and more as um, an intermediary tool for, um, for onboarding on Bitcoin. So, you know, uh, sometimes not everyone gets, the, uh, gets Bitcoin um, immediately. And, but they still want to experiment and uh, they still want to have access to these new technological rails for, for finance. And I think that stable coins there are a great tool for that, right? So uh, Tether USDT is nothing more than a dollar, right? So um, it shouldn't uh, provide uh, different uh, features than, than the dollar. And um, as, as I always said, Tether is not Bitcoin. There is only one Bitcoin and... Uh, you know, Bitcoin has uh, its guarantees, is decentralized, is um, is a ultimate freedom tool, and Tether is just like a mere servant. is um, is something that can be used to uh, onboard the, the next wave of people into a faster, more digital financial system, and then they can go from there. They can keep learning and finally uh, look into to Bitcoin uh, as the ultimate stage. Right, as part of being unbanked. Uh, the use of Tether, U.S. dollar, and other fiat surrogates is um, a great way to stay unbanked. And that is to say, you don't need uh, the formal banking system to do everything that you can do in the legacy banking system. I wanted to ask you about the second largest stable coin, USDC. It's got a market cap nearly as large as that of Tether. And yet the daily transaction volume of that stable coin is a very tiny fraction of Tether's volume. Tether does 10 times as much volume. How is that possible unless, unless USDC is something completely different? So um, USDC has uh, definitely a different business model uh, from, from what I see, right? So um, their, their approach is to be um, to, to trying to onboard as many um, banking institutions as possible. I mean, it feels like uh, in general, the approach is trying to copy the business model of Tether, trying to grow as fast as possible in market cap. But at the same time, uh, on their side there, um, I feel like they are looking at the uh, wrong angle or they are trying to, to solve the wrong use case. In, in general, I feel that um, Wall Street has already the best banking rails, right? So they don't need, um, they don't need another version of the dollar, right? The, the, the speed at which they can settle the dollar is much, much faster than anywhere else in, in the world. So I feel like there is um, an important need of the dollar outside of the US, right? We are talking about Turkey, we are talking about uh, Venezuela, uh, Bolivia, um, Argentina. We have seen Bloomberg reporting that Argentina Argentinians are trading and buying Tether at a premium of 6%. So the, the reason to exist of stablecoin is to provide uh, a dollar access to whom wants the dollar and is outside of the US and especially lives in emerging market developing countries. So I feel that that's the reason why our volume in Tether is dwarfing the competition because there is actual usage, right? It is peer-to-peer -peer usage. People are buying stuff, are selling stuff with Tether, accepting Tether payments, and of course is still the leading um, uh, pair or a trading pair when it comes to um, uh, crypto trading. So um, I think that we, having us invented this uh, industry, we understand really well the use cases and we want, we understand what are the things actually that matters. And I believe that uh, having people actually, and normal people actually using your technology, right, this stable coin is the most important Thing. It's most important result. So Tether did not invest uh, in marketing in, in South America, and yet Tether is being insanely used across all the region. And that speaks really highly about the utility of, 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 um, of a product, right? So if a product works and is being used and adopted without the necessity of, of pushing um, a ton of money uh, into marketing, that means that uh, it's just useful by itself. So I think that is the biggest difference um, between Tether and its competition. Now, uh, governments, especially in the EU, are calling for regulation of stable coins and are also suggesting that they may 
themselves introduced central bank digital currencies. Your thoughts? So the, these uh, central bank digital currencies are definitely a tricky topic. Let me explain why. Um, in general, I came from the traditional financial world where uh, I was working to, into uh, the banking and hedge fund industry, trying to uh, provide software for these uh, institutions. And uh, I, I came um, to the realization that the entire technological infrastructure of the banking industry and the financial, traditional financial industry is kept together by rubber and bands. So um, that was, it has been built on top of 30 years of more and more rubber and bands. And um, in a way, you could imagine that uh, if uh, all the banks could settle all the banking transfers uh, through um, a private blockchain, that with private blockchains could have the feature of or have the feature of um, providing the same information to all the participants, right, if the, all the nodes are in sync. And that could reduce by a large amount the, the, the amount of money spent in maintaining that outdated and old infrastructure. Now, of course, now the, the one issue, though, and that is a large issue also raised by uh, some um, uh, members of the U.S. Congress, is that CBDCs can actually be used as a, instrument, a tool of control for people, right? So uh, actually, there was a bill uh, proposed by, in the U.S. Congress that was trying to ban uh, uh, U.S. from building um, uh, CBDCs, and that could apply also in... Um, uh, should be something to consider also in you. I'm not against that as a technological improvement, but my worry, as many other people, is that uh, it could be used to actually decide whether or not a person could or could not use its own money. And that, of course, is extremely dystopian or rebellion, but you know, you want to, to avoid the problem before you get to it. So uh, we are. We have seen uh, in in the EU how um, uh, they uh, potentially have even or they're trying to ban unhosted wallets, so transfer to private uh, wallets where people would uh, uh, hold their own private keys, and that of course is a, uh, is another bad symptom, right? They also talked about potentially um, uh, banning uh, um, proof of work that didn't happen, th uh, thankfully. But you see, these all these attempts are uh, not genuine, and um, I'm pretty glad that uh, there there were many working groups in the European um, Union and part of many discussions with uh, lawmakers that were able to push back on, on all these ideas. And hopefully, we, there will be a little bit of balance when it, they will take the decision on how to use uh, their CBDC. Right. So central bank digital currencies collectively, and including one of your competitors, USDC, are collectively referred to as surveillance coins. What does that mean? And how is Tether different? So um, Tether is a centralized stable coin, right? So Tether works, uh, um, is registered with FinCEN, works with law enforcement and with regulators around the world. So we have, of course, to uh, comply with our duties using being a centralized stable coin means that we are relying on the banking system to receive wires when people want to issue Tethers and um, also process wire, outgoing wires when people want to redeem Tethers. So uh, it's important that we comply with the regulation and rules of, of, the, um, of the banking industry. At the same time, it's important to um, properly understand how your stable coin is being used, right? So we want our stable coin to be used by peers, by people, um, in in Nigeria, in uh, in uh, in Congo, in uh, in uh, Vietnam, in India, right? So uh, again, in, in in Latin America, it is spreading um, really fast. So we believe that is important to ha see a stable coin, although centralized, being used in in a free form like cash, right? So when you have your cash at hand, uh, you know you know that uh, you are a legitimate person, a good person, and still you shouldn't be subject to uh, a direct control over, over, over the government because that will limit your, uh, inherently limit your, your freedom, right? So imagine that eventually you uh, write a tweet on Twitter and, uh, you know, someone will knock at your door and say, well, you know, the money that you have on your wallet, you cannot use that. Uh, 
uh, because um, you have posted that thing. So either you can sell it or you delete it or, or you know, uh, your money will remain frozen. So, of course, in at Tether, we ask ourselves all, all these things and uh, we want to make sure that uh, uh, while complying with, uh, with the requirements, we also remain true to the ethos of, of Bitcoin that is, um, you know, uh, being having people being their own individual sovereign. Okay, now let's move on. So Bitfinex recently donated 36 Bitcoin and $600,000 worth of Tether to El Salvador. Stacy and I have been distributing it here in El Salvador on your behalf. Uh, what are your thoughts so far on the di distribution? Well, first of all, I really want to thank uh, Stacy and, and yourself, Max, because, you know, um, when you enter in this type of initiatives, it's really important and critical to make sure that the money is is properly spent in a way that is beneficial to to the ecosystem, to the local local ecosystem. Right? I don't have the presumption of knowing how you know what is the best way to do it. Right? So only people like you that uh, live on the territory and uh, are are you know a deep part now of of the ecosystem can understand how. Uh, money can be beneficial um, to uh, to a growing community and a healing community. So um, I, I'm really happy to have seen many initiatives that uh, that uh, have took place in in the past weeks. And I know that you are also uh, dedicating a lot of efforts to education. That is a concept that is extremely dear to me, but also Big Phoenix and, and Tether at large. Right, no intermediaries. You know, Stacy and I went into the neighborhoods, typically gang-ridden neighborhoods, and we went P to P, peer to peer, and we transferred Bitcoin uh, directly from you guys through us into the wallets of locals here in El Salvador, and uh, it's a beautiful moment uh, of uh, activism uh, enabled by the good guys with Bitcoin. Now, the Bitcoin, uh, the Bitfinex platform, uh, will host El Salvador's volcano bond. Uh, when is that going to be issued? It will mean that the new securities law here in El Salvador will have already passed. President Bukele says he believes that El Salvador can be the Singapore of Latin America. Do you agree that they can lead the way into a hyper-Bitcoinized world? Well, I definitely do agree that um, um, El Salvador has uh, a big chance of becoming uh, the most prosperous country in, in uh, Latin America, right? So um, I think that uh, uh, Mr. Bukele, the president, had uh, um, this uh, vision before anyone else. And he was uh, quick. He executed with, of course, the, the government and taking you know, advantage of this uh, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So um, I'm with Bitfinex. We are humbled and, and, and proud of um, uh, having provided uh, our platform, our technological platform, as support to the Volcano token. Um, I think that um, this shows, and I, this is one of the possible best um, stories that will be told in in the in the financial books, right? So this is the first time that the government will raise money for its own people through a different medium rather than the traditional banking industry, and that is extremely important because if you think about it, because uh, it means that you, the, uh, finally um, uh, the government can cut a ton of intermediaries and the majority and the vast majority of the money that they raise actually gets into their pockets to build the, the, the infrastructure that they need rather than being paid in fees through many different steps so, and, and intermediaries. So that's the things that excite me most, right? This is, again, um, something that was never attempted and uh, has the chance to become uh, really real in the next uh, few months. So from what I hear, um, the, the government is, uh, is getting uh, back ready uh, to execute on, on, uh, on the law and uh, the, uh, the, the licensing part and uh, the key to make information documents that are the final stages of, uh, of, um, the, of preparation of the Vulcano token. Paulo Andorna, thanks so much for being on Max and Stacy Report. Thank you, Stacy and Max. Okay, and that's going to do it for this edition of Max and Stacy Report, coming to you from El Salvador, land of the free, home of the Bitcoin. I want to thank our special guest, Paulo Ardano. Until next time, bye, y'all. <laughs>